and so these guys are about to take it away for us. If we could please lower the volume so that we can get started. Thank you. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Dylan. I work at the MENA Foundation, which is a ZK-focused layer one blockchain. Uh, I'm joined here by a panel of ZK experts. Uh, let's just go down the line and you know, quickly introduce yourself, how you got into zero knowledge, and a little bit about your company. Um, hi everyone, I am Daniel Helm. I do developer relations for Scroll. Um, I got into ZK from uh, being in the blockchain space for a while, doing decentralized storage and thinking about applications on top of that. And then I, you know, you come into this big problem of how do you verify compute in a reasonable way. And so that was my introduction into ZK. Um, apparently I'm not loud enough here. So I ended up getting quite excited about use cases as they cross over with blockchain and eventually found Scroll as the scaling solution for Ethereum and got super excited uh, about the possibilities there. Um, <laughs> we got a little bit earlier start, but we got Candy here too from the Anthem Network. <laughs> yeah. Hey everyone, I'm Bruno. I work at Aztec Network. Um, I would say that I spent a couple years around the crypto space and really wanted to work on a project that was, um, quote unquote, working on something real, like actually working to scale Ethereum, actually working to um, like reach this final vision of, of what we think crypto can be for the world. Uh, so I found Aztec, all of the other projects on stage are also similarly cool and working on the same problems, but uh, yeah, that's how I ended up at Aztec. Uh, hi, I'm John. I'm the CTO at Veridice. And so we are a security company who works on uh, verifying and securing these uh, ZK circuits. And so I got into the space because um, I did research into uh, analyzing and verifying things in DeFi. And then we started learning more and more about these ZK circuits and exploring some of the really interesting and uh, difficult to find bugs that can occur in uh, like ZK specifically. And so since we are very interested in developing tools, uh, yeah, we, we kind of just started working on tooling and finding bugs in ZK circuits. And I mean, so far we've looked at a lot of circuits, including like Circom Lib, Circom Pairing, Semaphore, uh, and other ones, which I'm forgetting. There's a lot. Hi. Okay. Sorry, John. We're going to have to share. Hey, I have that exact same uh, shirt. Got it yeah. in Bogota. Yeah. yeah. Nice. I, I remember giving one to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I wear it a lot. It's super comfortable. You guys should grab one if they have some. Uh, so I'm Kenny, and I'm using context clues to try to figure out exactly what I'm supposed to intro myself as. But um, co founder of Manta Network, and uh, we are also uh, using zero knowledge proof, surprise, surprise, uh, specifically for the use case of on-chain privacy. And um, much like uh, our, my colleagues here, I'm also trying to build something real. And <laughs> so um, I think like one of the things that we realized, and I think you know, definitely you know, Aztec as well, is that on-chain privacy is a pervasive issue uh, that spans across whatever use case you're trying to build on. Um, that has anything to do with blockchain. And I think that if you look at how things are going to be scaling out five years from now, ten years from now, like going into that space, going to the Web3 world that we hope to achieve, privacy is really a critical piece of that. Um, and so, you know, really proud to be working on something along that line. And yeah, I think like at least us in Aztec, we can agree that um, ZKPs are the way to go. Yeah. Incredible. Thank you so much for the, you know, just the background on all your projects. Um, let's start in the beginning. I'd love for someone to kind of set the stage. Uh, zero knowledge proofs have been around as an academic focus since the 1980s, but really found a foothold in crypto. Can someone just kind of explain how our industry has progressed since Zcash in 2016? Who's the best historian out of the four of us? Um, it's fit, fit, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can talk a little bit about it, but not that much. So, uh, yeah, ZK Circuits basically got their start in the 1980s. Uh, however, one of the main issues that they ended up having was in terms of the 
uh, expressiveness and the proving time that it took in order to verify uh, these computations. And so really, um, and also the fact that uh, ZKPs were originally required uh, interaction between the prover and the verifier, which as you can imagine is not really going to work out well uh, when you are working with a blockchain. And so uh, once ZK snarks came on the scene, then um, which allowed a, a proof to be generated that could be verified without the interaction between the verifier and the prover, then applications were able to start using them for uh, the Web3 space. And so I think the first application of that was Zcash. And so they uh, jumped in, but one of the problems with the original version of Zcash was the proving time still remained relatively long. And so over the last couple of years, uh, there's been a Okay, a lot of advancements in terms of the proving time and also the size of the proofs and also the security guarantees, which has really allowed these uh, protocols to actually use these ZKPs in practice. That's incredible. And I think, you know, zero knowledge proofs have kind of hit mainstream as kind of a way to scale Ethereum. You know, we're luckily joined by two ZK rollups in Squirrel and Aztec. You know, I'd love to learn a little bit more about your approach to scaling Ethereum, your particular use cases, because I know Aztec is very ZK money, privacy focused, and how you kind of interact with the Ethereum layer one. Yeah, so um, the, the reason that Aztec, so the way that Aztec thinks about this is there is no way today on Ethereum to have privacy. If you want to interact with the various applications, whether it's DeFi or purchasing an NFT or just interacting in some way on Ethereum today, there's no way to do that with privacy. Um, Aztecs roll up um, and our consumer application ZK Money was the first way that you can actually interact on Ethereum and get some of that privacy using zero knowledge proofs. Um, ultimately, I think the vision is a little bit bigger than what we've got today with Aztec. Right now, what you get from Aztec is you sort of hide in a crowd. Um, if all five of us were to deposit one ETH into ZK Money, for example, um, and then one of us chose to do some sort of DeFi interaction, like swap on Uniswap or you know stake your ETH with Lido, um, what you get on Aztec today is you get the benefit of hiding in the crowd of the five of us. You don't know which of the five of us is the one actually doing that interaction, and that's how you get privacy um, today. Now, the future of Aztec is a fully decentralized zero-knowledge roll-up with public and private state. And so it's a little bit more expressive, uh, a little bit more robust, a little bit more generalizable. Um, but given the fact that zero-knowledge proofs are... Um, developing rapidly, the landscape is changing rapidly, the current iteration of Aztec, the current iteration of ZK Money is sort of our, our way to demonstrate what might be possible on Ethereum in the coming years. Um, and so I think what we've got today is a really cool approach to demonstrate, yeah, just like how do you get privacy using some of this crazy moon math, using some uh, crazy cryptography. Uh, but we've definitely got bigger plans in the immediate future, and uh, the current iteration is sort of like a stopgap as we try to demonstrate what's possible while still pushing the vanguard of, of like what the next generation system will look like. That's great. Daniel, would love to hear a little bit about Scroll as well, just given the fact that you were trying to create as close a EZK EVM as possible. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, so I think we have a really good contrast of projects for representing the breadth of ZKPs. Um, because while Aztec is really focused on this privacy element um, and adding that into the Ethereum ecosystem, we're super focused on scaling. So one of the things about zero knowledge proofs is that you, know, you get to have these inputs into like a function and you change something and then you have an output of the function, right? In, in zero knowledge contexts, you get two really wonderful things. You get one, these private inputs that you can still get your function and no one has to know, you know what the private input was, and they can still guarantee that you didn't lie when doing that function. But the other thing is, is that after that function is done, the output comes with this little proof 
And that proof can be used to kind of just say, hey, you don't have to go redo all that work that some machine did off in the cloud. You just have to check this little receipt and say, yes, no one was lying when this thing was done. And so we call this succinctness. We get to use this tiny little proof to say that this giant project was done correctly and without any lying. So, all right. Tangent done there, what Scroll does is that we do a ton of work. We, we do the entirety of Ethereum on a layer two, but then we print out these little receipts and commit those back to the layer one. We post those to Ethereum along with the transactions so that we can totally increase the block space of Ethereum and make it even faster and have more throughput so that users have lower fees, lower costs, and, and all that can happen just in a secondary layer on top of Ethereum. So we're building what we call a ZK rollup. It's a layer two on Ethereum, so. It's incredible, and you know, Bruno, I wanna come back to you with Aztec, just because you kind of are a very big pioneer of technology. You guys started basically the Planckish architecture that is the proving mechanism for all of us here, <laughs> pretty much, uh, which is awesome. But you also kind of just recently released Noir, which is your new domain-specific language for zero-knowledge contracts. Could you kind of go into how Noir differentiates or compares to some of the other ZK languages like Snarky.js, Leo, Cairo? Uh, and then I do want to open it up to everyone uh, as well, just to understand how you kind of think these languages will coexist in the future. Yeah, yeah, so Noir is something we're really excited about. Um, one of the challenges, I think, with anything to do with zero knowledge is it's just complex, it's just difficult, it requires context on, you know, foundations of computer science, on higher level mathematics, on, of course, like, all of us are using it in a blockchain context, so you need that. Um, and so what Noir is aiming to do is really expand the the total market of developers that can write programs that use zero knowledge proofs. Uh, today, a lot of the languages out there, um, just they require you to have a bit of a cryptography mind. And I think that zero knowledge proofs have some really like incredible use cases that'll be opened up, but we need to expand the pool of developers that can actually just write programs that take advantage of this crazy math uh, but don't actually have to know the crazy math. So our domain-specific language, Noir, uh, it compiles, it's, it's in a Rust syntax. Rust is a language that a lot of developers are familiar with. It compiles to an intermediate representation. Um, and then that intermediate representation actually has an arbitrary backend that can be used. For us today, it's our Brettenberg crypto library based off, uh, off Plunk. But you can imagine a world where we have a Halo 2 backend, a Ganark backend, uh, you can use an arbitrary proving system with Noir. And so the idea there is that developers can write programs in a Rust syntax, in a syntax that they're familiar with, that they're comfortable with, abstract away a lot of the complexities of the cryptography, and then take advantage of arbitrary backends uh, to make whatever trade-off they want in terms of performance or you know, X, Y, and Z, all the different trade-offs that you can make within uh, the space. So what we're really trying to target uh, to your question there is is simplicity and opening up the pool of developers that can write programs that use zero knowledge without needing you know a PhD in mathematics to to be able to reason about the cryptography and the circuitry that's that's going on back there. Yeah, uh, is there kind of any way that you guys expect to see these languages interact with each other in the future, or you know where do you see this kind of playing out? Uh, well. Um, <clears throat> I think like one thing to kind of bear in mind here is like, you know, the, the go-to language right now, or the go-to sort of development, um, I guess for, well, the go-to is right now CIRCOM, right? And even CIRCOM itself is, uh, it's not something that you can just pick up if you're like a full stack developer or something, right? It's a completely different sort of mindset. Um, and, and what we're starting to see is people are even abstracting away CIRCOM. And so in terms of like one way of interaction, right, like this isn't exactly the, the parallel, uh, you know, level of interaction, but more so like a hierarchical level of interaction where like, you know, some levels, uh, some languages could be even further abstracted away. And I think like that's, that's also something that we're seeing. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I want to stick with you, Kenny. So Manta Network uses a UTXO-based model instead of an account-based model of on-chain accounting. Could you explain why you chose that method? Uh, yeah, so um, for, I guess, a little bit of background between like, you know, the account-based model and UTXO. So everyone using like MetaMask or something, uh, you go on like Etherscan and you see like account one sent one ETH to account two, right? That's the typical sort of account-based model. Um, but when you're looking at the UTXO-based model, um, that's like if you guys are using Bitcoin and you send a transaction, you look at like a Bitcoin uh, explorer, and you're like, wait, why did this get split up into like two different transactions? I thought I sent only one. Uh, that's kind of how uh, a UTXO model uh, differs from an account-based model. And so uh, a, a real-world analogy here with UTXO is like, if I have $10 and I need to pay you know, John uh, $8, right? John gives me back $2, right? And so it's like, I, we, I, I took that $10, but there's two things that happened. One, right, it got, it got split up into an $8 payment to John, and two, it got split up into a $2 payment back to me. So that's kind of like how the UTXO model works. Um, Should we model this in real life to make it more concrete? Uh, you know, uh, with inflation rates, probably not, you know, but uh, you know, we, can try it. we can try it later. We'll do a, an off-site demo if you guys want to come to our workshop room. Um, but anyway, so that, that's how the UTXO model works. And the reason why we decided on that, and this is something that a lot of other sort of, um, or not a lot, but other privacy projects uh, on the ZK side use as well, such as Zcash, um, is because it separates the actual account user and the person from the assets. And so that gives that extra level of sort of privacy protection between the actual wallet address, the account, versus the assets that are storing those, wall or storing those assets. Uh, so that's why we decided to go the UTXO model. Hopefully that. And, and for what it's worth, we have the same model on uh, Aztec's roll-up today because it's really hard to do privacy without the yeah. UTXO model. Exactly, see, many projects use UTXO. <laughs> uh, I think Alio is also using a UTXO-based model, so it's pretty popular. Nice. Um, yeah. the, um, I want to take a little bit broader approach to this conversation now. The number of ZK, the percentage of ZK developers is you know, quite a small percentage of total blockchain developers. What roadblocks exist and how can we fix it going forward? We already talked a little bit about the languages, but let's jump into the many other bottlenecks that actually do exist. Well, I think we already touched on one of the main issues, which is the fact that developing in these ZK languages... <laughs> okay, Can, I think that's better. Okay, developing in these ZK languages is a lot different. So typically when someone comes and they're a full stack developer, they're used to actually you know, writing the code that performs their computation. But when you're developing one of these ZK circuits, typically in a language like Circom, um, what you're doing is you're specifying two different things. You're specifying the actual computation that you want to do, and then you're also specifying something that's going to check that computation. And the checking logic gets really complicated because there are certain things that you think should be equivalent to each other, but they just aren't. Like, uh, there are certain inputs that aren't really covered. And so uh, in order to make things easier for developers, I think one approach, which I think both Mina and Aztec are doing, is trying to abstract away uh, these you know, two different systems. Basically, you only write a program once, and then after that, both the application and the uh, circuit are going to be generated. And so that's one thing that will make things a lot easier. However, not all developers are going to fall into that model because there are other classes of programs where maybe you want to do a really large, complicated uh, computation off-chain, like, let's say, run some blockchain node, and then you just want to check it on-chain. And so in that case, you would still need both types of languages, but one would probably be more for, like, advanced users, whereas the other one would be more for, uh, you know, your more typical Web3 developer. The other thing that I think is kind of missing in this space is the ability to uh, easily check and make sure 
you know, the computation that you're doing is correct. And so I already talked a little bit about uh, the differences between these two languages, but right now people are primarily uh, developing in this language where they have to, you know, write the computation and the circuit. And so one of the problems that you end up getting there is that uh, your computation might be correct, but your circuit isn't. <laughs> And so what happens in that case is you might have a circuit that can accept anything. So let's say uh, essentially you define a circuit that is essentially true. What happens is in that case, if you, you know, test like most Web3 developers uh, expect they should be able to, they'll send inputs to their application and then it will go and it'll get to the verifier and the verifier will say, great, yes, that was accepted. However, they're not checking the circuit in isolation, which means that someone else can create another application, and that application will now also be able to have inputs accepted that is outside of the scope of the intended behavior. And so I think that languages need to be advanced in some of the ways that uh, both MENA and um, Aztec are you know, working towards, and I think tooling needs to be advanced to make some of these, uh, you know, assumptions that are being made within this domain more explicit and to be able to more easily find some of these problems that occur. I might build on that to, to one other aspect, which is I think just like, you build these languages so that developers can use them and I think the accessibility to developers in ZK space is super rough right now. Um, I think I'm really looking forward to a time where I don't know, there's, there's a lot of good, strong mental models about building ZK applications. There's educators like, that we've seen in Web3, like Austin Griffith and Build Guild and all these people that are able to go and advocate for like layman developers and not you know, the PhDs in mathematics. And I think uh, the abstractions with languages are one of those things, but also s telling stories about how to build up mental models for designing these applications is gonna be really important. Definitely. I mean, those are all great points. And I think just broader, broadly speaking, just generally in the blockchain, getting consumers to actually adopt it, we need to abstract away any kind of complexity in order to get developers to, who aren't PhDs uh, to kind of come in and actually build ZK apps or you know, build within zero knowledge proofs. Uh, we need to really improve our tooling aspects and just uh, think it will be <laughs> extremely important for the growth of our sector. Um, and, you know, I kind of want to talk a little bit about, you know, where you see zero knowledge kind of going in the future and what kind of use cases do you see beyond just payments or, you know, scalability? Yeah, I think the obvious one is um, when you first hear about, like, why would you use a blockchain, people will say things like, well, your bank, you're censorship resistant, so your bank can't stop your payments, or you have these cross-border uh, payments that settle instantly, and like, that's so cool. Um, I think that's only gonna reach a point of mass adoption when my grandma in Argentina receiving my crypto payment doesn't tell everyone exactly how much money she has in her crypto wallet, right? Um, we can't expect Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan to start putting syndicated loans on the blockchain if everyone can see like the details of their syndicated loan. It's just not reasonable. It's, it's, it's just blocking our adoption is, is privacy. And so zero knowledge, like just putting privacy on Ethereum immediately makes it a lot more um, approachable by the general public. Uh, for example, we have someone building a merchant payments dashboard on Aztec, right? Like really cool, instant settlement, all these benefits. If you don't have the privacy, like merchants don't want to show everyone what their balance is and like the benefits of instant settlement um, don't outweigh the downsides of like showcasing your balance to everyone. So, so just privacy alone slapped on top of Ethereum opens up a bunch of, of use cases. Um, some other ones, I, I think it really ossifies the censorship resistance because if you talk about like participating in a DAO or being a part of an NFT community or something, like, that's all awesome. Your NFTs are hosted on Ethereum, censorship resistant, decentralized, and whatnot. But if everyone can see what you're voting for, if everyone can see what you support, it, the vector for, for coming to you and censoring you is still there in the sense of 
meet you in person and force you to vote the way that you know, I want you to vote. Uh, so just really opening up how governance works. Right now, I think we're still in the MVP days of governance and privacy and zero knowledge overall uh, really opens up the door for like really cool governance experiments, which is like a subsector of, of crypto that's really interesting. And then uh, finally, like everyone keeps talking about blockchain games. Uh, some of the best games that we play day to day outside of a crypto context are incomplete information games. And like that doesn't work if your game is built on Ethereum you, can, you just leak too much information and it sort of defeats the purpose of the game. And so right now we're seeing really rudimentary versions of uh, games like Battleships or um, I, I don't want to overpromise the games that we're building, but we, we've got someone building like a Flappy Birds game. That's really cool. As zero knowledge gets more performant, as it gets more ubiquitous, as it gets easier to write these zero knowledge programs, hopefully in noir, um, I think ZKPs will open the door for like the reality of, of cool blockchain gaming, even if, um, if we admit that a lot of crypto is just a casino, like awesome, let's put poker, let's actually do decentralized poker, but you can't do it if you're showing everyone what your cards are, right? Um, so I think it opens the door to a lot of cool applications. Um, I think I said payments, governance, and gaming. Uh, I'm sure you guys will add a couple more. Uh, I'm happy to go. So um, first, can't wait for ZK Flappy Birds. That sounds awesome. Um, the, I think another thing, apart from like, you know, specific use cases, is something broader. Uh, and it's a problem that we all talk about. It's user experience, right? Like, we're always like, oh, you know, why can't we get a billion users on Web3? Why can't we get like 100 million daily active users that a lot of these top tech companies are getting? And the, the number one complaint goes to user experience. And I don't think people realize just how big of a user experience friction uh, exists today due to a lack of privacy. Is the voice coming through okay? Okay, cool. So, uh, <laughs> so um, show of hands, how many of you guys um, interact with the you know, Ethereum blockchain or Ethereum applications or just use MetaMask on like at least a monthly basis? Okay, great. So, um, how many of you that ha interact with MetaMask um, have more than one wallet address on MetaMask? All right. Guy in the very colorful shirt right there. Why do you have more than one wallet address on MetaMask? Uh, for a lot of different reasons. I have one wallet for my contract, one wallet for personal, one wallet for testing, uh, a few wallets for performing airdrops, things like that. Right. Yeah, I feel ya. I actually got an Ethereum Denver ticket, and I forgot which wallet I applied with, and I can't even claim that dang ticket right now. Um, and so the reason, this, the purpose of this exercise is essentially to show you that, like, you know, we're splitting up our identity on chain already because we don't necessarily want everything to be associated with one another, right? And so, like, apart from just being like, oh, you know, did I just get cut off? No. Did I say something wrong? <laughs> um, apart from just like, you know, transacting and using a wallet address and that being intimidating, everything afterwards is part of the user experience as well. When you generate that second wallet address, when you generate that 15th wallet address and you're trying to manage all that through a freaking MetaMask interface, as amazing as MetaMask is, it's not meant for all that stuff, right? But that's like how people are already using it because on some level, we are concerned about privacy and association. Uh, so I think like, you know, having that sort of element included uh, is definitely gonna be a big step towards like a broader adoption also. I'll jump in here. Um, so I think privacy is super exciting. I think the other things I find exciting are using the blockchain to uh, do what it's good at for consensus and kind of like checking certain compute layers. Uh, but being able to do crazy stuff off chain and then committing that back to the blockchain to be verified. Um, so I'm not just trying to shill the narrative of scroll a little bit, um, but I think that we'll see a lot of really cool stuff for decentralized storage, really big data sets that you know big computers have to do stuff over, but they're able to provide these proofs and still do um, you know 
on-chain commitments for those items. Um, I think indexing is gonna be super exciting. All sorts of stuff where right now the decentralized web um, I think is uh, not yet able to flourish because of the, the speed and capacity of, of blockchains as they are right now. Um, and then also as a UX thing, uh, if, you, if you do do all this stuff off chain, yeah, you can get to start layering all these, uh, these blockchains on top of one another, interacting cross chain, using ZKPs uh, instead of light clients uh, and, and more traditional bridges. Uh, and so there's a lot, of, a lot of really cool things that are gonna open up and I'm hoping that the developer experience doesn't get more fragmented, uh, but we can kind of like keep coalescing around um, I don't know, the developer tools that are uh, maturing and that people are excited to be building with, so. Yeah, this tooling kind of goes hand in hand with just kind of the industry adoption, industry growth, and just generally pushing other narratives as well. So, you know, at MENA, we're doing a lot of work on the ZKKYC space, which could hopefully produce a nice little database of regulated entities, which kind of brings me into my next question, uh, the dreaded question, sorry guys. Uh, how do you manage privacy-related tools with compliance and regulatory issues? I'll go for yeah. it. <laughs> I'm, I'm used to answering this question, so it's all good. Um, yeah, I think in the, in the short term, the response is that you, what you want to do is you want to make it really difficult for um, bad actors of any sort to use a system, really create practical deterrence where your average user can still utilize the system and get the benefits of privacy, um, but bad actors are either unable to use it outright or have to go through some very challenging hoops to do so, and so the impracticality makes it infeasible for them. In the long term, one, we need our regulators, both at home and abroad, to do a better job communicating with the space and figuring out how to prioritize uh, legislative goals while not stifling innovation. I mean, I know we could do a full panel on that on its own. And in the long term, the truth is the approach to any regulatory, uh, any fears of regulatory bodies is true credible decentralization. Um, that's why you can't shut down Ethereum. It's truly credibly decentralized. You can go put Vitalik, uh, you can go grab Vitalik if you want. He, he has no red button to turn off Ethereum. Um, and if we want to create systems that are truly censorship resistant, um, what we need is credible decentralization and frankly, all of our projects and everyone in the crypto space needs to hold each other accountable to that credible decentralization. Um, with zero knowledge specifically, it's, it's very difficult because a lot, of this, a lot of these systems are still being built. Well, you're, you're building the plane as you fly it or whatever the saying is. Um, and a lot of this, cryptography research and development is still ongoing. And so it's a difficult line to walk, but I think the reality is we, we need true credible decentralization of our systems. Um, and in the meantime, what we need to do is practical deterrence so that bad actors don't use your systems. Agreed. And um, I think like, you know, the approach to privacy that we see today, um, especially on-chain privacy, I want to say The year is 2012, and you are in your basement farming Bitcoin, mining Bitcoin, and you go outside and you tell your friends, hey, I'm mining Bitcoin. And your friends say, are you trying to buy drugs? Are you trying to like money launder? What are you trying to do here, right? Fast forward to 2022, right? And we've got institutional funds looking at Bitcoin, right, um, as part of just their normal portfolio right, of assets, uh, no longer majority associated with dark money. Um, I think that privacy needs to go through the same sort of transformation. Right now what we're seeing is, oh, you use privacy? What, do you, what money are you trying to launder, right? Like we're in a bear market, there's nothing, to, <laughs> right? But like there's, there's a lot of different aspects of privacy, which we just, you know, did a little sort of thought experiment together on um, that we don't really recognize, that don't really take center stage, but rather right now we're focusing on all the negatives. 
Uh, but on the other end, right, I think it's very important, not just from the, the ecosystem side, but from the regulatory side to understand the implications of not having privacy available as well. Um, and so, you know, we're at, this in, we're at this point in 2023. Things are going to go three ways. I mean, infinite number of ways, but I'm going to simplify it to three. The first way is everything's going to crash. Bitcoin, blockchain, you know, all this Web3 stuff is just going to disappear tomorrow and no one really cares and everything we're talking about today, I mean, well, ZKP stuff, you know, we, we, we're, we're still living, so, you know, we're immune, but everything else is gone, um, in which case, you know, on-chain privacy and all this stuff doesn't really matter anyway. Um, second scenario, we kind of just flatline to where we are right now, right, and the majority of use cases is yield farming and NFT marketplaces and, you know, metaverse stuff. Okay, that's cool. Privacy is kind of important, but not like super critical in this component. But I think the third scenario, which is where we all want to be headed, is like five to 10 years from now, I walk into a Starbucks and I buy a coffee and bam, right? It's some type of transaction that shows up on some blockchain and you know, I walk out of there with a coffee cup in my hand. Um, in this scenario, where there are a billion users, three billion users, um, what happens when there's not privacy? Now all of a sudden Kenny walks into this Starbucks on the corner of UPenn and you know, bought up coffee like two minutes ago. Now the entire world, anyone with an internet access knows exactly where Kenny is right now, right? I, I mean like I'm not really that important of a person to actually care about, but imagine if this was actually someone important, right? Like that's, that's kind of a security concern. And um, yeah, that's just kind of like on a very sort of fun little example, right? But when you scale this out to a population of 360 million Americans, for example, right, now it becomes a national security issue when anyone with an internet access can now see all the activities of your citizens. It becomes a corporate issue when it is like, okay, all the activities that you're doing and you know, how you're buying or in your purchasing habits and all this stuff can be surveilled and collected and analyzed with competitors, right? Like, so, so it becomes a much larger problem than like, oh, Kenny wants to go buy drugs on the dark web. We should stop him from buying drugs on the dark web. So there should be absolutely no privacy on blockchain. I think like regulators, I, I, you know, at least the ones that I've, I've spoken to, right, like are, are, are aware that this is an issue and you know, right now the question is like how do you find the balance? It's not about like whether or not privacy should exist on chain, but more so like in what form should it exist? Yeah, sorry, I, I figured that the two of us probably get this question more than the two of you guys. Um, one thing I want to call out that Kenny made me think of is when I talk to friends and classmates and people in the United States generally, uh, as Kenny said, the, the question is like, oh, well, why do you care about privacy? Like, well, I don't need privacy. I don't care what the government sees of, of my own actions. I don't care what anyone else sees. Like, um, in the 1990s, the United States government tried to put encryption software on a munitions list. Um, the alphabet soup of three-letter agencies uh, tried to basically ask for backdoors into encryption software. Um, for the sake of, as we've seen over the last 30 years, claims of protecting national security and using that to infringe on Americans' um, constitutional rights. The writer of PGP, one of these encryption softwares, wrote a fantastic letter uh, when he open sourced the software, when he just put it out in the world and open sourced it. Um, and he has one quote that really sticks with me, which is, if privacy is outlawed, then only outlaws will have privacy. Um, I think one, I recommend everyone goes and reads this. It's, it's a phenomenal le letter by Philip Zimmerman of PGP. Uh, but second of all, it's a very, for lack of a better word, privileged view of the world. Um, it's something that we in the United States are able to say like, yeah, we, we have pretty good liberties. We have pretty good relationship with our government and with, um, with, with, I guess with the government generally, but the, not every country in the world, but I would say the vast majority of the world's population doesn't have that liberty and doesn't have uh, that freedom of persecution from their governments. And so privacy on blockchains is a way to give the 99% of the world um, access to the same liberties that we in the United States have. So, um, yeah, just something to keep in mind when you're thinking about whether your own privacy is valued. We, we live in a very privileged country uh, for those of us that live in the United States, but 
my home country of Argentina, uh, many countries in South America, in Asia, in Africa, don't, don't enjoy those same privileges. And so, uh, yeah, that's what we're working towards at, at Aztec, and I'm sure Mance is working at the same thing. Um, yeah, privacy is a human right. It's not just uh, a nice thing to put on top of the blockchain. I completely agree. And, you know, Kenny, specifically, uh, I think your point that just because you want privacy doesn't mean that you're doing anything nefarious. So, you know, maybe we can do another thought experiment here. Do you want your internet history shown to the world? Probably not. Therefore, you should probably want privacy by default, or at least given the option for ha to have privacy. Um, so I think that's an extremely interesting point. So I think we're nearing time soon, but I do want to ask one question. So I'm sure we have all seen the Vitalik chart for ZK EVMs based on performance and compatibility. Why is it so hard to have a performance ZK EVM that's compatible with the Ethereum layer one? Um, because a lot of the things in the design for the layer one, like codes and the op codes are not efficient with the math of ZKs when you get in there. Um, one kind of classic example is the Kekak hash that gets used a lot. Um, there's other hashes that are, work really well and gain a lot of benefits uh, in the ZK space, but um, those aren't you know, natively there. And so what you'll see is that ZK teams, in order to make these things, these problems tractable even, um, like we, we run provers that um, need almost a terabyte, well, we've gotten it down, but at the time they needed almost a terabyte of RAM on one machine to be able to generate these proofs. Um, and so obviously these problems are very complex at the moment, and so to, to make these things more tractable, you can go in there and kind of swap one hash function for another one where it works in the ZK context. Um, and so you see examples of this across the EVM that, that can change that. Awesome. And as it relates to just kind of evolving the ZK hardware technology space, how do you kind of think about trusted setups in the future? Is this something that you think will go away? Or is this something that you think is kind of a requirement and a hopefully people aren't doing anything nefarious within the trusted setup? I mean, trusted setups are already, you know, kind of going away, and that's one thing that is, you know, a lot of people are currently working towards. So, as I'm sure at least some of you know, uh, you know, for some of these proving systems, you have to have a trusted setup for every single application that's being run, and sometimes you are lucky and you can have, like, a large community, which allows you to create a very large uh, trusted setup ceremony. However, when we are talking about like onboarding new developers, one of the issues that they have as well right now is finding people or a sufficient number of people in order to create a large, you know, trusted ceremony in order to help show, yes, my circuits are safe, no one is going to have this secret that would allow anything to get proven. And so uh, to get around that, now there are other proving systems which have this universal trusted setup, so you only need to perform that trusted setup ceremony once, and then it can be used universally, which is great. And then something else that's uh, starting to be seen in uh, research literature is trustless setups, where you don't have to perform any sort of ceremony. I am not a cryptographer myself, so I don't know the specifics about it, but you know that would eventually do away with this whole trusted setup stuff so that you know, hopefully anyone can use this without having to worry about the size of a particular ceremony or whether people are keeping their secrets around. So um, we actually just completed a trusted setup. It's actually got the, the, the record for the largest trusted setup in the world thus far. And so I hope trusted setups go away because I don't want other people trying to break that record. <laughs> um, but apart from that, I think like, you know, to, to John's point, right, like trusted setups are an, an indication of just how early we are in this space. Uh, <laughs> because, uh, yeah, there, I mean, th we are, we're in the process of this transition, this transformation where, you know, having all these different participants just to build something or to construct something that is secure and trustworthy in, a tr in the trustless, most trustless way possible, right, like no longer needs to happen as it did in the past, 
Um, I think we saw, you know, Zcash recently shifted away as well, right? Like they don't really need trusted setups moving forward also. And so, you know, like I, I do think like this is a good indicator and also overall amazing for the space because it just speeds up the, or reduces the friction for development and deployment. I think that's, uh, that's our time. And honestly, this has been extraordinarily interesting. And, you know, my key takeaway here is that we're going to get Flappy Bird uh, on the blockchain. So I'm holding you to that, Bruno. And, uh, you know, thank you so much for joining. Uh, really appreciate these incredible answers. And, you know, feel free to uh, let us know where we can contact you. Oh, uh, I'm on Twitter as DG Helm and uh, scroll underscore ZKP. I'm also on Twitter. Um, but you can just email me at bruno at aztecprotocol.com if you want to chat. Or I'll be hanging around here if you just want to come up and say hello. Uh, I am also on Twitter, but to the dismay. I'm also on Twitter as uh, Super Anonymous K, so Super Anonymous and the letter K. And I also have my um, Telegram QR code here. So if you want to talk, just come up and scan it, and then we can chat. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks.